for participating in the Know Your Candidate Forum sponsored by the Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial Association and the Southeast Georgetown Community Council, lovingly known as GCCMA and SEGCC <laughs> respectively. My name is Regina Durden. I'm with GCCMA and I will be your moderator for this session. Mr. Chuck Collins with SEGCC will be our producer extraordinaire and uh, will be monitoring our questions and keeping time for us. This morning, we're gonna be taking some time out for you to get to know the candidates running for Georgetown Independent School District Trust Board of Trustees Place Five. Our candidates for this session is our incumbent, Ms. Melanie Dunham. Hello, Melanie. Good morning, everybody. And Mr. Eric Robinson. Hello, Mr. Robinson. Hello, Ms. Durden. Thank you both for being here with us this morning and taking time out to answer some questions for the community. This is an important election 2020 and the way, the way you answer the and respond to these questions will help make decisions uh, as people go out to vote. So thank you both for being here. Before I begin, I have a few announcements that I have. First, I wanna let everyone know that in order to preserve the quality of the video, we're going to mute everyone. The forum is being recorded and will be posted on the GCCMA and the SEGCC websites. If you have questions that you wanna ask the candidates, we're asking you to go to Slido, as www.slido.com, number nine, I'm sorry, number W944. If you notice in the chat box, there is a link to Slido that will take you directly to uh, the, the candidate forum questions. The questions will be asked based on popularity in Slido. Uh, therefore, if you see a question that you like that's already posted, please hit the thumbs up icon. The more popular the question, the more likely it will be asked. And then we ask that you not ask the questions in the Q&A or the chat box, but instead go to Slido. Now for the format. The forum will begin with the two candidates given two minutes to offer opening statements. Then we'll ask a series of questions and each candidate will be given a maximum of three minutes to respond to each question. We will continue asking questions as time, time allows. The candidates were given, the, given some questions of beforehand uh, and we expect to go through those questions, but those questions may change if the audience have has more pressing questions and it becomes popular. Got that, candidates? So let us begin with the introductions. Each candidate will, be, will begin with two minutes to introduce themselves. And that should include your background, why you're seeking the position, and what do you see are the major duties and responsibilities in this role. Uh, Ms. Dunham, we'll start with you and your two minutes begin now. Okay. My name is Melanie Dunham. I'm running for re-election to place five of the Board of Trustees. And um, I grew up in Round Rock. Uh, my mom was a single mother. She worked for the police department. She raised three of us on her own. And I was uh, a free and reduced lunch kid. I had a lot of extra time on my hands. And it was teachers who really showed me that I had uh, more potential than I was really learning at home. And, uh, and really gave me the, the time and attention and love that I needed to succeed. So I went on to be the first in my family to graduate from college. Um, and I work in nonprofits. So I help really vulnerable people get the things that they need. Uh, veterans and first responders, people facing rare medical diagnoses, um, a lot of really sick kids and adults. So my work is centered around helping people professionally. Uh, I have four daughters, three of them are current GISD students. We moved to Georgetown in I think 2004 and we moved to Old Town. So uh, my kiddos went to Annie Pearl. I still have a kiddo at Annie Pearl. Um, it's where you know our home base is. And so I really spent a lot of my time helping families in, in, uh, in the Annie Pearl area. So um, living and working and, and volunteering have been kind of, um, kind of what I've been doing for the past 15 years in Georgetown. I've served on a lot of nonprofits, um, nonprofit boards, education foundation, boys and girls club, every PTA, of course, 
And um, I love volunteering with our community and helping the, the families that need us the most. So it's my, it's my privilege to serve um, and, and be a part of this community in this way. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Mr. Robinson, your two minutes sure. begin now. Okay, thank you so much again for hosting this. Again, I'm Eric Robinson and a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina. Um, my father was uh, the first person to go to college in our family. Both my grandfathers were coal miners in West Virginia. And so my father spent one year in the coal mines and decided to go in the military. And once finished there, took the GI Bill to get to go to college and became a teacher and a principal and an athletic director, a coach. And I have a brother who's a coach and teacher. And so education is really prominent in my family. I chose to go the route in education as a school psychologist. So I'm trained as a school psychologist, working in public schools in South Carolina, mostly in a district pretty similar to Georgetown ISD, working with children from the most fragile students to the most gifted students. I'm working a lot with teachers and parents. And after that, I decided to go back to school and get my PhD. So I went to the University of Kansas. Um, where I earned my PhD, but while in Kansas, I was able to work in Topeka, Kansas um, as a classroom management consultant. Um, Topeka, Kansas, as we know, was the Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, so it's really interesting to get a chance to work in, in that town, uh, city. Um, I was also able to work at the University of Kansas Medical Center, um, where I worked with children with autism, did autism assessments, and also did an internship at Boys Town, which is a residential treatment facility in Nebraska working with children and juvenile delinquent, pre-juvenile delinquent students. Um, I've spent the last 23 years working in Texas, living in Texas, where I teach at Baylor University, where I direct our graduate program in school psychology, which is in the School of Education, um, and teach teachers and, and school psychologists. I also do a lot of workshops with teachers and parents, and, and I think I bring that kind of experience in, in depth to a school district. I've engaged in a lot of school districts around the country, and think I understand kind of the difference in those that work well versus those that don't. And my role as a board member is to kind of help ask tough questions and kind of monitor what the superintendent does and hold people accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Now so, we're going to dive into our questions. Let's start by discussing your idea on where we stand right now. With more than 12,000 students in the GISD, the Board of Trustees governs the district by adopting policies and regulations. The key roles and responsibility, according to the GISD website, is to hire and evaluate the superintendent, delegate all administrative responsibilities, approve the district's, but, uh, approve the district's budget, establish goals and evaluate outcomes, adopt and evaluate policies, and then to communicate with the community. Each year, Several times a year, students are to take home a report that provides a grade of how well they did or how they were performing in the classroom. So today we ask you, on a grading scale of A to F, how would you grade the performance of GISD? Uh, this could include student performance, parent and community engagement, looking at the goals of the board, looking at policies established, how would you grade the overall performance of elementary, middle school, and high school levels of education in Georgetown? Uh, Mr. Robinson, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think that, that some of our schools do better than other schools do. Um, I think if I had to kind of give an overall rating, I would say our schools are kind of like a C, maybe C minus. Um, and because I think our main goal in education is to teach our kid academics. We have a lot of other things that we do. We do some amazing things. We have a great robotics program, great cosmetology. So we have most of our students, I think, do really well in school. And I think they would do really well in most school districts. But I think the charge of the school is to just to educate all students and really to focus on our most vulnerable students. And vulnerable students mean a lot of things. It could mean students that live in poverty. It could be mean students that, that have a learning disability or some kind of a emotional disturbance, mental health issues, cognitive issues. And so our job is as a district to educate all our students as well as we can. And I don't think we do real well there. Um, as we know, of this, the STAR test scores have been dropping the last several years. In 2019, um, six of our 16 schools had Ds or Fs and none of them had As and that's uncalled for. We should not have a district with that. A district like GISD should never be in that situation. Um, and I think that's a big issue. Our special education program has been kind of needs improved category, which is kind of a failing category. 
um, for years and years. And that's another issue that we have to take on. And our discipline referrals have really gone up. And it's not uncommon. When you see students that are struggling academically, it's not surprising to see discipline referrals go up. So those do tend to go hand in hand. We have to do things to address that. You know, we got a score of an 83 back to star test. We got a score of an 83 overall in 2019, which rated us as a B. Um, and I know that's been publicized, which is an accurate measure to publicize, but I think it's a little deceptive because most schools in this state or most districts got A's and B's. So when you rank order that 83, you take this district that had the highest score and the district with the lowest score, and you rank order those 1,202 school districts, we came in 822nd. So 822 out of 1,200 districts was our overall star test score. So in other words, 68% of the districts in the state did better than we did. So that's why I kind of say we're like a D, C rating when it comes to that measure. You know, our career, uh, college career military readiness scores, I think we do better there. We definitely, we score better than the state, but we don't really do any different than, than, um, than, our, than the region, region 13. We have about the same score, which I think 70% of our students passed that the last time it was measured. Um, but I think we really, when you kind of dig into the data, we struggle some. Again, our, our, our Hispanic students, I think 66% pass. Our African-American students, only 43% of our students pass. And when you just look at, at career readiness or co college readiness, um, we have some disparity in kind of our academics area also. And so I would give us overall, again, some schools do better than others, but as a group, I would say we're kind of a C minus as a district and need to improve that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Ms. Dunham, your three minutes begin now. I would say uh, that I would probably give the district a needs improvement. Uh, overall, probably a C. As Eric said, um, you know, we have an overall rating as a B with TEA. And on its surface, that's not bad, but we do have some, some schools that were rated Ds and Fs. The problem with this rating system is that it doesn't really take into account a lot of the really great work that's happening for kids that isn't related to the STAR test. So um, our ACT and SAT scores exceed region and state year over year. Our graduation rates, our attendance rate, um, our CCMR is, is uh, leading as well. And I think that those are all really important things. We understand as a district that it is our job to get kids K through 12 educated and on to their best success, whatever that may be. And as public schools, it is our job to take every kiddo that walks through our door and prepare them for the future. And that might mean going to college and it might mean graduating with a certification. It might mean uh, you know, graduating and going straight into the workforce. Whatever that is, we have to prepare them for that. And so we've really bolstered our CTE programs. We've really bolstered our dual credit and our <clears throat> AP programs. We're doing the things that we need to do to get kids ready. The changes that we've made though are taking some time. We realized, I think in 2018 is when the, the state changed the the rating system and we got those results back and that caused us to pause for a moment. We started looking at data. We started to try to figure out where are the gaps in, in, our, in, our, in our education system. So we were looking at uh, curriculum. We were looking at um, programs. We we're looking to make sure that things were implemented with fidelity across the district. That wasn't always happening. So it, we took a step back to try to find where those deficiencies were. And then we started to implement some changes. We started uh, doing more assessments more frequently throughout the year so that we could better monitor what kids were doing. We, we didn't want to get to the end of the year to the STAR test and find out that we've made some mistakes. Um, we've bolstered our teacher training to make sure that they know how to use the tools that we provide for them, that they are um, designing engaging work because we know that that's a huge factor in getting kids to be engaged with school um, and learn the material and then go on to succeed. So we, we have to make sure that, you know, we are providing an experience that makes kids want to come to school. We need to, we need to you know, help them to be lifelong learners because they're gonna need that no matter what they're doing. So for us, you know, we, we acknowledge that we have made some mistakes. We acknowledge the things that we're doing to make them better, but we aren't going to stop teaching our learner profile, which these global competencies are critical for kids to go on to be successful. They have to communicate, they have to collaborate. They need to be critical thinkers. We're doing those things, but those changes do take time. And I think that it is worth investing in our teachers and kids to, to do that so that we're successful. 
Perfect. Thank you both so much. Now we're going to move on to COVID and the impact that COVID has had on us. This year has been a year of challenges for our students, the teachers, faculty, administration, and just the community at large. While this has been a new and unusual time for everyone, the effects of the pandemic are truly affecting the students and their families. For example, here in Georgetown, we know that there's a student, there's a family with, with three students, they're sharing one device. They're trying to do their homework with one device. That is a, there's a lack of internet service. There's a lack of appropriate meals for students. Parents are having difficulty with educating their kids at home, while then they're, they're fearful of sending their kids back to the classroom. The pandemic has drastically changed the delivery of goods, services, and education. The late, in the late spring and summer could have been a time for retraining our teachers and preparing the parents and the community at large for this transition of, to online learning. What are your thoughts for guiding and directing the GISD administration to move more aggressively into this new era for education in light of all of these challenges? Uh, Ms. D Ms. Dunham, we'll start with you. Well, I hope that there isn't a family sharing devices like that because we, we definitely have Chromebooks for every student um, and we were ready for that. Um, our initial uh, purchase of Chromebooks was waylaid by the global market, but we are, we are ready to go. Those, those are real challenges, especially for our families that live far from um, from their campuses, and we're working really hard to make sure that, that they have the tools and the resources that they need. Um, kind of getting forced into this model of learning um, has been good and bad. You know, we uh, were able to really fast track the one-to-one -one devices that we wanted to be doing um, for years that was set out in our strategic plan in 2014. We really wanted to offer more remote um, opportunities, but you know, kind of changing course to something that's a little bit more radical is hard. It's hard for teachers to get on board with. It's hard for the community to get on board with, you know, making those kind of big changes um, usually takes more time, but being forced to do it all of a sudden has really been a bit of a blessing. That being said, there have been missteps. You know, we're, we're not um, naturally an online education system. We're a system of schools, brick and mortar. And so it took some time. I will say that our teachers and administrators did a lot of training over the summer. Um, you know, teachers who are not even on contract, we're doing, we're learning and, and we're answering emails and we're participating and we're, we're gearing up because they want to provide the best experience for kids. I think some ways that we could be more aggressive is, you know, not by telling our, our teachers and administrators what to do, because as the board, that's not our job. You know, we, we are to provide goals and guidance uh, to, to really carry our moral imperative of, of teaching every student forward. So, uh, you know, I would love to see um, our, our administrators and our teachers feel empowered to be really creative in the solutions that they're, um, that they're providing to, to really look at different um, platforms. Um, I think that we should do better at, at looking at established online school models. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. You know, what best practices can we learn from? I think there's some you know, some hesitance to, um, to look at, at those kind of models because they feel like they're maybe competing for our attention. But really there's, there's a collaborative opportunity here that, that we could really um, explore. And I, I think that, you know, empowering our district to do those things would be really helpful. I think that we need to be afraid to fail fast uh, and pivot if we're gonna have to. I mean, this is a learning experience for all of us. None of us have ever been in this situation before. So having some empathy um, for the mistakes and, and giving some opportunities to grow is really important. And we need to make sure we don't forget about SEL, you know, making sure that our kids are socially, emotionally healthy, um, even if they're not in the classroom is critical. And we're definitely working towards that too. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Mr. Robinson, your three minutes sure. begin now. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think COVID, as we know, uh, is significant impact and it's, it's a once a generation, we hope it's once a century event. Um, and in, in March, I, you know, I, I give tons of room for GISD and other districts to kind of figure out what to do when things kind of shut down literally overnight. 
um, I have given a little less room for us kind of where we're at now, because, you know, we've had several months to kind of plan, and that's been some of my concerns is, you know, when I watch the, the May and June board meetings of 2019 and the May and June board meetings of 2020, they seem, they looked a lot of lo alike, and they should not have looked alike. We're in a vastly different place. So I think we were kind of slow to respond to kind of planning out our future for our kids in the district. Um, I, in July, to give credit to the board, they had a lot more meetings, a lot of workshops that were streamed so people could see. Um, and I think the board asked a lot of good questions um, of the superintendent, who in turn would, would turn, ask questions of his staff. Um, the problem I had with that was that sometimes the questions were vague or they weren't well answered and there didn't seem to be a lot of follow up on those things. So I think that's kind of a concern. And we were delayed, as you'd mentioned, Ms. Durham. Um, I've heard the same story of kids using, having to share um, technology because we were kind of slow to order order that. I think we ordered our, our second batch in July, which was way, way too late in this kind of context. And most districts had been planning, or districts that were functioning well, planned well before that. Um, so kind of where we are now though, right? Kind of where we go in the future I think we have to try to engage our community and how we're going to improve. Um, as you said, we have some very vulnerable children and I think COVID kind of showed to set our society two things. Um, one is the, it's separate the haves and the have nots. You know, the really wealthy people in our country have become stunningly wealthier. And we have, while we have a tremendous amount of unemployment and I think that's impacting our, our community also. We have kids whose children are, we have kids whose parents aren't working and struggling. We have people sharing, said sharing technology. We have kids that don't have Wi-Fi and we need to be people, we need to make sure we as a community, I think it was a school community, um, have a moral obligation to, again, to teach our most vulnerable children and those are our most vulnerable children. We know that we have students that being at home is not a great situation for them um, and, and, and parents struggle to figure out, do I bring these kids to school? What do I do with my kids if I work all day in a job I have to go to work? as opposed to some people who can work from home. So I, I'm concerned about this kind of disparity that we see in our community and how to fix that. Um, I think we have to engage our community a lot more. I think we have some wonderful community opportunities. We have boys and girls clubs. We have a variety of things that we can do to try to engage the community to help us move forward in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. And speaking of community engagement, that's our next question. Uh, community, community engagement and communication. Now there seems to be a question of real engagement. There, there are nonprofits that are out there that attempt to engage and assist the district. There's community appointments to advisory boards that don't necessarily seem to reflect the demographics of the district. Board members are not required to respond or to engage uh, to presenters at the meetings. And then there's some question regarding the effectiveness of the learner profile. What will you do to ensure that, the, that there is true community engagement? How will you work with nonprofits and other organizations that can provide assistance and resources? How will you ensure that the community involvement is a representative of the school population? Uh, Mr. Robinson, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, that's such a great question. I have worked in multiple organizations, you know, I've worked in medical settings and university settings and public school settings. And I sometimes see what I believe you're getting at, Ms. Durden, which is, which is that, that an institution, whether it's a, a district, which we'll speak of now, whether it's a medical setting, they, it, it appears that they're engaged in the community. But when you kind of get down to it, there's a lot of let's, let's check some boxes, right? Let's say we're engaged in a community. We have people on boards and, and, and yet they don't really get to engage. It's not a two-way conversation. Um, and I, I can't speak specifically to GISD. So I'm not being critical of GISD. I'm speaking in general, this has been my experience, um, is that you end up with, with communities where, where, the, where the institution, which the district will come and tell the community what's going on, have lunch and then leave and, and say we, we're engaged in the community. So if I'm on this board, I'm going to try to change that because that's frustrating for me. And I've been on both ends of that. Um, I'm going to try to work to where we truly do um, have conversations with people, listen to people, make sure our, our boards are, are representative of our, of our demographics. I mean, in GISD right now, I think about 46% white, 44% Hispanic, 
like forest percent black. And so we in 1.5% Asian. So I think we need to try to make sure we have balance and, and we pull from all communities, all voices get to be heard and we listen. And when I mean listen, we really listen. We don't have listening. We don't say we're listening, but not listen. We engage individuals. We have committees that, that go out and bring data back to the district because I'm a data driven person. It's kind of a boring thing to say, I know, but I'm a person who likes data. And I like this to base decisions. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do to engage our community. Specific to data and the learner profile, as you mentioned, Ms. Dirt, and I think that's a, that's a great point to bring up. The learner profile, every board meeting I've attended for the last two years, online or in person, always addresses the learner profile. It's often pretty brief, but it's addressed. And I've yet to see the district provide any data to show us how this works. Um, and and there, there are great points to make. You know, it's great to have you know, um, uh, group, 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 kids together, together in groups. It's great to have people who communicate, collaborate, but I've yet to see any data to say this is impactful. Um, we have data to show some other things are impactful and I've always been kind of wanting and wishing that we would see some data presented to the, to the community because again, one of the roles of the board is to communicate to the community how we're doing. And I'm a person on the board would, would ask for data. And if we're gonna have a learner profile and focus on it, then we need to have some data to show that it's working, that our students are more engaged in, in positive thinking and critical thinking. Um, so I think my time's up, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, Ms. Dunham. Okay, I have to remember all of the components of the question. Um, so our community engagement really, you know, my experience at this level, our community engagement began, um, uh, you know, really kind of uh, ramped up in, in 2013 when we started working on the strategic plan. And that included, um, you know, community, I think 280 community members of which I was one um, to kind of develop these really big goals for students. And that included, and, and they were they were not um, meant to be specific, like every student will learn French. It, I mean, it was really, we want every student to have these measures of these successes. Um, and there were, you know, lots of really global ideas that were presented and, and that what, you know, is really where the learner profile came from. Our community came together and had a voice to determine what education in Georgetown was going to look like. We wanted them to be um, successful in their future endeavors. And that would include all the elements of the learner profile. It was not our job to tell teachers how to do that. It was then uh, educators jobs to kind of figure out how to implement. So that's kind of the beginning of how the community engagement really began in Georgetown. Um, and when Dr. Brent was hired, uh, he was really, really um, adamant that we had more community involvement than GISD had really ever had. Um, and what I, I think, you know, while that was a great step, um, the amount of, you know, early actionable community engagement that we've had has been, has been lacking. Um, it's not something that is, has been historically, uh, a, a, a relationship that school districts have had with community because, you know, they, uh, it's kind of a new way of thinking. So we've got some work to do in that. We've got a couple of um, committees where our community is, is really involved uh, to make decisions, Shack being one. And I know that we're having um, more involvement with our equity um, program that's, that's in year two of being developed. So those are opportunities. We've definitely got growth in that area that we need to work on. But from our, you know, from the board standpoint, you know, we we are focused on governance and 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 guidance and vision and communication. And so, um, our role with the community is, is to engage in that way. And I think that you know we're we're working on that. We've we work with our nonprofits that we've got uh, partnerships with to to pick up some of the the needs that we have that are really specific. Um, and they're doing a great job with that. They're, you know, they're, they're, it takes a, a whole lot more than just academics to really have successful kiddos. And so that's where we really lean on our nonprofits and, and let them, um, you know, share their expertise with us. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Well, we have a popular question in Slido. So we know that um, Georgetown is one of the fastest growing cities in the nation and the population that's coming into Georgetown is diverse. 
And so what we wanna know is how will you address the issue of the district staffing to reflect the student population uh, as it relates to the demographics? Um, Ms. Dunham, we'll start with you. Um, that's a great question. And it's one that we um, are talking about in our district as well. Our, uh, you know, equity is something that is, is really on a lot of people's minds right now as it should be. Um, and it has, has really provided us an opportunity to make some systemic changes. So our, um, our equity plan that Cindy Pike is spearheading um, is, you know, began last year and it's, it's taking a, a really deep dive into our curriculum, our staffing, our hiring process, um, the way that our schools are run and any systemic inequities that we have. And that's not, you know, that's not a comfortable conversation, um, but it's one that's absolutely necessary. And, and I think that, you know, it is, it is our job to make sure that every kiddo and every staff member feels included and welcome and safe and loved um, so that they can do their, you know, do their best work and be successful. I think that we are gonna have to make some, you know, some process changes in hiring to make sure that uh, our staff reflects our, our kids. I mean, it's important to see people who look like you when you're in an environment and, and see, you know, successes for people that, that look like you and have that, you know, that relation. It was important to me, um, you know, to, to reflect or to be a representative for low socio eco kids. Um, I think it's important for kids to see that if they come from addiction or incarceration, they can go on to graduate from college and, and get a job that really helps people and, and you know, find successes. It's, it is important to see how, you know, people that share your same background um, can move throughout the world. And, and I, I can't represent kids of color. I understand that. I think it's important that, that kids of color have, uh, have role models and, and people that they, you know, that really understand what the you know what their experience is. So I think we're going to have to make some changes, um, and that's you know that's a hard thing to do, but it's really valuable, and it's something that we're committed to, and it's something the board is committed to you know to exploring, and something that I'm you know planning to to fight for and ensure happens. I think it's really important and critical for our kids. Thank you, Ms. Dunham, Mr. Robinson. Sure. Um, uh... You know, I, I, as you said, you know, our community is growing significantly. Um, we, we see that when we get stopped at traffic lights for longer than we want to be um, in Georgetown. But the, but the advantage of this is we have to take advantage. We have to kind of be and embrace the diversity that we have. Um, our district has become more diverse kind of slowly over the last decade, but, but it's a beautifully diverse community. And we need to take advantage of that instead of trying to almost ignore this is going to happen. Um, I, you know, I think specifically kind of down in the weeds, what we need to do, and this is to echo what Ms. Dunham said, you know, we need to kind of look at, at our staffing. Um, I, right now, as I mentioned before, we're about 46% white as a student body population, 44% Hispanic, and about 4% African American, 1.5% Asian. Our teachers look very different than that. Our teachers, last I looked, about 85% of our teachers are white. 14% Hispanic and less than 1% are Black or, or Asian American. And so I think we need to be very systematic in how we try to change that. Um, we need to do things. We need to have a diverse application applicant pool. We need to recruit diversely. We have to be purposeful in where we recruit educators to come to our community. And I think as a board, that's something we can, we can charge the community with. We can charge the superintendent to do. I mean, this is one of the roles that we have as an oversight is to kind of let the community know what our expectations are. And our expectations should be that we're going to diversify our, our faculty and our staff and our administrators to do that. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy that we've hired Ms. Pike um, to work with the equity. I think that's a very powerful thing. I met with her at a Courageous Conversations meeting a couple of weeks ago, and she's very enthusiastic, and I think she's working very hard. I think that's really important. I think some of the work that she's been doing comes out of the Educational Trust, which is a national organization, which is really important, and I think it'd be great for us to try to bring, you know, Dr. John King, if we could, who's the president CEO, to, to this community it would be a wonderful thing. If we can't do that, then we can invite 
um, the Texas representative to come to this uh, the educational trust. So I think we can do a lot of things to send a message. We're embracing our diversity. Um, the concern I have a little bit, and this is something on the board I would pay close attention to. And again, I'm not saying this is happening with Ms. Pike at all, but I've seen this in other situations. Her job title is the director of the CCMR. And so I, I'm not sure if the equity is just like an add on to her job or kind of what the role is, but that's not her title. And sometimes I've seen in organizations where people kind of have an add on job. They have a really hard job to do, but it's, it's kind of comes at the end of their other job. And so I would really make sure that's not going to be the case for her to where we make sure we fund and support what she's trying to accomplish because this is critically important for us. Thank you. Thank you. And just for our audience, could one of you uh, tell, tell us what CCMR stands for? Sure. Uh, College Career Military Readiness. Sorry. Perfect. Thank Sounds you. Sounds like an old band no from the '60s, but no, 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 no. I just, I just, you know, <laughs> I want to just make sure that as we're engaging the community in conversation, that uh, they know what we're talking about. So my head is just spinning with more questions that I can't ask personally. But you know, as we talk about equity and and diversity, that we not only think about the teachers, but we think about the leadership. We need to make sure that there's enough decision makers that uh, reflect the demographics of the community. So I hope that we also touch on that. And uh, speaking on that, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the future of the district. And before I, then I'll go back to another slide on question, because a lot of ties. Um, one of the duties of the school board is to provide strategic direction uh, for the district. According to a 2019 GIS data, 44% of the students are at risk and 33% of GISD schools are graded with the D or F in educating children at risk. The faculty ratio and leadership is not reflective of the demographics is what we talked about. And also uh, in a recent report that was published, a GISD quarterly report, it stated that 15, that, that there were 1500, approximately 1500 students uh, from in the 2014-15 school um, that were added uh, up to 2019 and 20 with a 14% uh, growth over the past five years. And then also in that same quarterly report, uh, it talked about um, students moving out of the district that uh, while 96% students transferred into GISD, 1,300 transferred out. That's a problem, or well, that, that appears to be a problem. We just would like to know what are your priorities for GISD? What strategic improvements do you see are necessary? And how would you engage the students, faculty, and most importantly, the community to develop and implement strategies for success? Um, Mr. Robinson. Sure. <clears throat> Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and you have kind of hit the nail on the head of some of the, the concerns in the district is, is we have in our community, but our schools aren't growing quite at that rate. And, and my concern is parents that are kind of looking around at test schools, variety of issues, and they're determining whether they want to stay in this district or put their kid in a charter school. And as you've mentioned, and from 2015, we've lost about 1,300 students and 900 plus of those have gone to charter schools or private schools in the community. And so I do think people are paying attention to this and, and, and it's, it's, you, it's hard to change a reputation. I think we're, when we have a great reputation, but it's a, little, it's a little shaky. So I think we have to really pivot quickly and hard to kind of make sure it doesn't get worse. Um, so how do we engage the community? I think that's a critical question that you've asked. Um, and, and I look around and think Georgetown's such a great location to do this. Um, you know, I spend time in academia, I work in universities, and I look at what resources we have in the community. And I'm in awe of that and think we should take advantage of that. Not only locally with the Boys and Girls Club, I think we can engage other community members. We have Big of Georgetown, which is, you know, it's for adults with, with uh, cognitive disabilities that we can, we can help transition students to. We can have some of our students do some workshops. I think we can do those things. Um, I also think that, that we can engage uh, Southwestern University and UMHB and University of Texas. 
um, they have amazing programs. When I look at the support that we need in our community, we, should, we can get those from those schools. UMHB has American Family Therapy Program. They have to have students with 3,000 hours of, of super, supervised experiences. Um, the University of Texas has one of the top social work programs in the country. They have to have 1,500 hours of supervision. Um, Texas State, which is UT and Baylor, all have school psychology graduate programs where students have to get 1,500, 12 to 1,500 hours of supervision. My point is that we have a lot of really inexpensive or free resources that these people give. These are, these are people in training that get experience and opportunities to learn in the community. And that's a way to engage just, just what is going on in our community. Much less we have Sun City, which you, I remember seeing people are asking to volunteer and to kind of have these, these systematic training programs for people who want to volunteer in our community to help our students because, you know, we have students that do well academically, we have students that struggle a little bit and some that struggle a lot. And we need more resources and money is finite. We don't have infinite amount of money, but we can use these resources, these volunteers, these well-trained people to try to help our students grow academically and behaviorally and socially. And I think we need to be able to engage our community and take advantage of what we have in our, in our area to do this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Robinson. Ms. Dunham. Thank you. Um, yeah, we saw the, the statistics of students that were leaving our district and, and we definitely, we don't want that to happen either. When, uh, you know, when our charter schools, our neighboring charter schools opened up, there was some uh, mobility from that. Um, and, and, you know, we are taking a look at the data to, to figure out, you know, what's going on with why students and families are leaving. Um, our main priority is to make sure that the families that, that we have in our care are supported and receiving the education and the services that they need. And so um, engaging the community for future success. I think it's time to, you know, we, we did the strategic plan in 2014. We, we revisited it. Um, I think it was last year. I think, you know, enough time has passed that it, that we need to go back to the drawing board in terms of a, a community summit and really, you know, reassess what our community would like to see for our students. What are the, the goals that we have for them? What, you know, how are our parents feeling? What are our teachers thinking how, to, how our local nonprofits and, and faith communities, you know, what, what are they seeing that, um, that we should be focusing on? Because, um, you know, their input is really valuable. They're the boots on the ground in our community. They're seeing, you know, our families and students um, every day. And so getting their input for future plans is really critical. Um, we had great success in mobilizing our community for that purpose in, you know, a, a couple of years ago. And I know that we can do that again. Um, and, and while everybody's time is short, you know, our community is, has, has proven that they're really committed to helping shape our education and our future with our kiddos. Um, so I think that that's really important. We, we do have a lot of really um, brilliant, dedicated uh, groups in our community. You know, we do have great relationships with Sun City, um, various civic organizations. We've got, um, you know, our, our different faith communities who really step up to provide those wraparound services for our kids. And so making sure that, you know, they're, um, you know, being effective in that, in that help and support is really important. We, we hear sometimes that, that, um, that we're really top heavy in administration. We're actually under in administration compared to other districts, both locally and in, that are similar um, in size to ours. So we have to really be careful that we don't, um, you know, put too many tasks on our administrators' plates. Um, so we need to prioritize which ones are most important. And obviously, um, student success and community engagement are really important to us. We just need to be careful to make sure that they're getting the attention that they need. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. There seems to be a lot of questions that relate to equity. So I'm going to try to put three questions into one, and this will be our Final question before closing remarks. Um, there's question. There's a question that relate to, you know, what would be your plan to engage leadership in addressing the issue of systemic racism, equity, and diversity? You know, and what uh, training do you believe is necessary? You know, how should that be addressed in the district? Who should 
who should take the training. And then finally, looking at special needs students. Uh, how would you represent equity in the district with these special needs students that would prefer remote learning? We will start with you, Ms. Donnell. Okay. Um, so when, when Cindy Pike uh, really dove into what the, um, the program that she's working on for equity is, uh, I was really pleased to see how, how deep the, the investigation was really gonna go, how um, we were gonna be looking at curriculum, we were gonna be looking at hiring discipline um, and, and, and all of the aspects that go into making um, equity and equality important in our district. Um, we've, we support that as a board tremendously. Um, I believe that everybody should go through training that, that um, ensures that, that they're not engaging in um, inequitable practices. I think every teacher, every staff member needs to be aware and go through, through training. I think every student needs to go through some, um, um, some training to make sure that they're not engaging in systemic racism and any other activities that can you know, be culturally insensitive. I think it's important and it's something I really believe in. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely gonna be up to uh, the, the staff that is working on that project to determine you know, what those trainings look like and how they're, how they're rolled out. It's definitely not a board um, task, but it is our, our job to, to provide guidance and, and, and set it as a, as a goal that we want those things to happen. Um, as far as special needs students, it's something I've been really passionate about for, for my entire tenure on the board and, and even long before that, um, especially you know, being at Annie Pearl where a lot of the medically fragile and special needs students are concentrated. Um, it's been my role to make sure that, not my role, it's, it's been my privilege and, my, and you know, my passion to make sure that uh, special needs students are a part of every conversation that we have at our level medically fragile students, especially, uh, making sure that their needs are met, you know, in whether they're in our classroom or not, you know, what does their learning and access look like? What does their access to programs look like? You know, we're providing a free and appropriate public education to every student that comes through our doors. And, uh, and you know, we have to make adjustments for that. Everything isn't, you know, a cookie cutter uh, academic experience in our schools. And I think that, um, you know, there have been, uh, some missteps in the years past, from what I understand, with our special needs programs, um, we've made so much progress. I know that we're, you know, really supporting those families um, better than we ever have. Uh, they're a high priority for us, um, and you know, it, it's it's something that is a part of uh, all of our conversations when we're talking about processes for uh, for the district to make sure that medically fragile students. Um, Spanish speaking families, all of our typically vulnerable kids um, have the best experience they can. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Mr. Robinson. Sure. Um, you know, I think that, that this is a really uh, wonderful topic to bring up. I think as, as Ms. Dunham mentioned, it's sometimes kind of awkward to bring up, um, but it's, that's, that, that, should, that means we should be talking about things like that, right? It's fine to be uncomfortable in situations. You know, when you look at a systemic racism and how that kind of applies kind of in our culture and how it comes, how it, what it looks like in schools. I um, mean, you know, I read an article recently kind of talking about, I think the title was a myth of racial progression. You know, how our progress, I should say, the myth of racial progress, how we've kind of improved. And it was interesting to kind of look, they did a study that in, 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 in 1963, they asked people kind of what they thought the difference in the white and black disparity in, in, in wealth. And at the time, Blacks had 5% of the wealth of whites, 5% of the wealth of whites. But when you ask people, they thought it was 50%. They thought they had 50% of it. You go to 2016, and this gap has gotten even bigger. 2016, um, Black wealth was 10% of white wealth in our country, 10%. Yet when you ask people, they thought it was 90%. So anyway, they thought that Blacks made 90% of what whites made when they were making 10%. So, and so the point of this article was that people are kind of saying, well, job well done, right? We, we've, we've made this progress over all these years when we haven't made progress. We've made some progress, but not to the extent that you would expect us to be able to make. And I think that's why when you look at 2013, you had that the Supreme Court voted down the, like the voter, you know, the, the Voter Rights Act, 
you know, because we're done. We, we don't have any racial issues in our community anymore is the message. Yet, you know, Monday, if you watch TV, we saw 10 and 11 hours, people were standing in line in Atlanta, Georgia to vote. And these were prim primarily black and, and Hispanic people standing in long lines to try to vote. So how does that apply to the school district, right? We're, we're, we're part of the community of the school district too. So I think we have to pay close attention to how we address these issues, how we study these issues and have these uncomfortable conversations at times. And I think it's critically important for us to be able to do to address equity. As I mentioned before, I think we need to really invest and make sure that people who are, are, are doing the training know how to do training. And, and I agree with Ms. Dunham, everybody should get this training right. Our teachers, our staff, our board members, our administrators, everybody should get this training. And my experience is not a one-shot training. Again, back to what I mentioned earlier, kind of a check-the-box training. See, we trained, we're good. Everybody now knows how to do this. I think that doesn't make a lot of sense. In my few seconds left, I want to echo also special education, which is really my background, is in this. Yeah, we have to do a significant amount to help students there because we have to look at our vulnerable populations and vulnerable can be, as I mentioned before, it can be from a low socioeconomic status to a disability. We have to take care of all those. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we're reaching the end of our conversation. And uh, as we wrap up, there's so many great questions, okay, in Slido. So there's a lot of anonymous questions. Uh, I just wanna encourage you that have these questions to reach out to these candidates, reach out to the current board because these are excellent questions that they need to be asked and uh, hopefully there will be some action behind them. Uh, but as our final wrap up question, I'm gonna go ahead and add one of the Slido questions to it. We wanna ask you what makes you the right candidate uh, for citizens to vote for as the GISD Board of Trustee place five? What is your view, vision for the future? Now, as there's, there's uh, students that are requesting to, uh, or GISD is, is considering remote learning to those outside of the district, I want you to kind of include in your wrap up, how do you plan to, to address the ones that are in the district and ensure that you're not leaving them behind also? And then finally, as you thinking about all of these issues, how are you going to garner, garner support of the other board members to ensure that there's action that's actually taken? Uh, Mr. Robinson, we'll begin with you. Sure, thank sure. you very much. Um, okay, I heard that echo, but it went away. Um, so again, why, why should you vote for me? I mean, that's the question that we're being asked. And what is my vision? I've explained in my background, I think I have intensive work in this, in this field. Um, I understand kind of the questions to ask, kind of the answers that we should be able to receive back and, and understand my role as a board member. As I said, I'm rotating off of a six year spent as a board member at a college up in New York where I understand the role that we have a university president and this person runs things and we monitor and guide. But within that, you do send the message to the community what, you're, what is important to you. And that is what the board can do. What is important to our communities driven by the seven people on the board? And, and we have to make it clear to, in my mind that our, what is the most important thing we do is educate our students. We have to make sure our students have a basic understanding of reading, writing, and math. And I think we're struggling to do that at this point. One of the concerns I have is that of our, of our test, our schools that did not do well on STAR the last couple of years, um, they're middle school and elementary school students. So we have this group of students that are kind of navigating through the system that are behind. And we have to figure out what to do to get these kids to catch up. Um, and it's not easy to catch students up. It's kind of like a marathon. It's a, it's a third year marathon. And these students are a little behind. They're a mile behind, some are a mile and a half behind. And it's hard to get kids to run faster to catch those that are already running faster. Anyway, that's how they got a mile and a half behind. So we have to figure out a way to do that. And there's, there are systems out there to do that. There's um, multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS, which is kind of like RTI, which is response intervention. In essence, there are ways for us to be systematic in working with our kids to help the kids that need a little more to provide them those services and those that need a lot more to provide them specialized services. And I think we do that 
by helping in, engage our community to come in and do this. It's kind of like a tier one, tier two, tier three system of education. And we can get a lot of support in the community to do that. We can bring Sun City people in, as I mentioned, all those things. We can do a lot of things to do that. So I bring an expertise I, to, to help push us in the direction to do some of these things um, and, and to work with other board members. Um, there's six other board members and you know, I've spent my career working in groups to try to get people to make decisions. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever been the boss of anything. I, you have to figure out when that is. So I'm always having to work with people to help guide. And that's why I use a lot of data to make decisions. You know, data, while it may sound kind of boring, but if you use evidence to make your decisions, I think people tend to rally around that. We have opinions on things, but if we use data to guide them, I think we'll be better. So I think it's a chance for you to decide whether you want to go in a different direction. And I think I can bring that fresh look in a different direction to, the, to our community and to our students. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, Ms. Dunham. Thank you. Um, what makes me the right candidate for this job? Um, wow, that's kind of hard. Uh, not because I think that um, I am a, a professional educator, which I'm clearly not. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, I didn't wake up one day and decide that I wanted to be a school board trustee. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in our community um, you know, getting to know families, uh, rolling up my sleeves and, and doing the work, uh, passing out meals at Annie Pearl for 10 weeks. Saw you, Chuck, there. That was great. Dropping off masks. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a, a degree in, um, you know, in education to provide strategic governance to a school board or to a district. What it does take is, uh, you know, a commitment to students and families and teachers. And that's, you know, that's what I have provided. I've really moved the needle for um, vulnerable families in my time on the board. Um, you know, I created the, the sports pass that helps families get into their kids' sporting events for $20 all year long. Um, have made sure that we are um, better engaging our Spanish speaking community with translated materials and printed materials made sure that vulnerable families, medically fragile families are a part of every conversation that we've had. I believe that my commitment to the social emotional wellness of students has really made an impact. Um, I'm also really data driven as well. Um, I've asked and pushed for metrics uh, when, you know, when we set board targets, you know, I demand that we have metrics for them and more assessment data so that we can better make decisions. Those are wonderful things. Um, my vision for, for the future of, of GISD is, is a, an, an academic experience that is um, tailored and customized for every student. And, and it starts with our students here. You know, we were discussing um, having out of district transfers and, and, and remote learners from other places, um, but our priority is our students here. So making sure that our kids that live in our community, um, that we know and love and, and know their families and are, are, are part of our everyday, those kids are taken care of. Um, I want to make sure that, uh, that you know, we're not overextending ourselves. It's something that, you know, I bring up in our meetings, you know, as often as, as it's necessary that, you know, we're gonna take care of our people first. Um, and that comes to budgeting and, and, and processes and, and all of the things that make a district run. Um, I've proven my commitment to this district. I have helped families that really need help. And uh, I would really love to, to continue this work that's so important to me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. And thank you, Mr. Robinson, for taking the time out and having this very important conversation. We thank you, the community, for participating, for taking the time out to listen, to ask those great questions. We know that this is just the beginning. We wish the best of luck to both of you. And we just hope that, you know, as a result of probably all of the candidate forums that you participated in, whomever wins will keep the community engaged, that there will be an increase in involvement uh, an increase in working with nonprofits, that there be an increase in diversity and staff and administration, all of those things. And we'll check back with you and see. We just want to make a quick reminder 
uh, early voting has already begun. Uh, if you have um, voted already, please encourage someone else to vote. Remember to remind them to not only uh, to, uh, to, uh, to go vote, but to go with your patience and most importantly, go with your ID. It's your right, it's your duty, it's your responsibility. And if you have need information about where to go vote in Williamson County, we're encouraging you to go to www.wilco.org. You can go to the GCCMA website at www.gccmatx.org, or you can go to segcc.org for more um, information. This has been a wonderful two weeks. Uh, we want to thank uh, GCCMA and SEGCC uh, for coordinating this. I want to thank uh, the president of GCCMA, Ms. Paulette Taylor, and the um, executive director of SEGCC, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Chuck Collins, uh, for your support. Again, thank you, community. Please get out there and vote. And thank you, Ms. Dunham and Mr. Robinson for participating today. Hello, Georgetown community. The Georgetown Cultural Citizens Memorial Association, in association with the Southeast Georgetown Community Council, brings you greetings and voter information today. November 2020 is a historic time. As we deal with a global pandemic, we are electing our next president, a new mayor, city council members, school board trustees, and countless other races. In Georgetown and throughout the country, they are expecting record turnouts. So we want to take some time out to encourage you to vote. Here are three simple tips that we believe that can help you. First, know when you can vote. Early voting begins Tuesday, October 13th through Friday, October 30th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And on Sundays, October 18th through the 25th from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Second, know where you can vote. For specific voting locations, visit www.wilco.org slash departments slash elections slash voting. We encourage you to vote early to avoid election day crowds. And third, there are no straight ticket voting this year. So completing your ballot may take a little time. You can print out a sample ballot by going to the Williamson County website, click on voter lookup, and sample ballot. You can mark your selections and bring them to the poll. So now you're ready to plan your vote. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to share this information and encourage your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors to vote. Mm -hmm.